this show is all about a lot more Castellani, um, lads, for obvious reasons. They won the double um, in Tipperary. Tears of sadness and despair this time last year, Niall, were replaced by more tears of joy and complete elation. Noel McGrath thinking of it was that kind of picture that did the rounds after last year's final. Um, your heart would go out to them. Like, I mean, the last minute goal after them going to point up, just heartbreak and stuff. To come back and win both. In the circumstances that they won the two of them as well, um, Niall, like, I mean, it's hard to believe what, they, what they've achieved here. It is. It's just, uh, it's an unbelievable achievement, really. And thinking back on last year's final, like, I'll never forget, the Hurling final especially, like, that was the first one they lost. And I'll never forget Noel McGrath after that game. He kind of just took his helmet off and thrown the hurl at the ground and he couldn't believe what was after happening. And then they lost by a point the next week in the football. And like it was just it was it was a horrible way for their for the for it to end for them. Like and to get back the way they have done this year, like it's just been like the the run they've been on 17 weeks in a row. And as we've been saying all along, it's been the same sort of way they've been winning these games. Just yeah. like and it was the same again yesterday. They kind of started slow like missing chances that you'd expect them to get but it seems with Lockmore like the game doesn't start until there's about 20 minutes to go and the stakes are really high and every ball has to be won and that's when these lads come into their own and it was the likes of John Maher yesterday he was winning balls like, and that's why he was man the match he was winning these balls that just he had to win and balls that were so hard to win and like it was that was that's what they do like and when when the pressure's at their highest they kind of come into their own yeah exactly and talk about like John McGrath again standing up when he's counted um, Leela so he got the goal to win the football last week this week he wins the free he scores the free not only is he happy enough with that there's a big ruck up the other end of the field about 30 players in it who's going to come out with it the referee let it let's let's see how this will develop it didn't develop for what seemed like an eternity um, when the game is in the melting pot. And then the referee throws the ball in. It looks like it hits off one of the players' feet, pops up into John McGrath's hand, bang down the field, final whistle blown. Like, I mean, Rye of the Rover stuff. Yeah, honestly. I mean, uh, I'd written an article last week about him, and I think I said that uh, it's it's his world and we're all just living in it, you know? <laughs> um, it sort of reminds me of, like, do you remember... Uh, if you were doing like creative writing in school, like in English, uh, and you had to write like a dream or something or some fantasy, you know, just where you, you achieve your ultimate goal or something. And like you and all your friends all had the same brilliant idea where you're like, it's all earning final day and it's the day in seconds um, or you're playing for Liverpool in the Champions League and you're the one that gets the goal or the winning score. Like John McGrath is like, he's, he's fulfilling the prophecies of all of them stories. You know, it's what everyone dreams of. And for him to do it one week after the other, it's like, People didn't even have the imagination to dream that up, you know, but he's gone out and done it. Like, it's it's absolutely extraordinary stuff. Yeah, especially after coming off not a great year with Tipperary, you know, like for him to be, like you said, he was a man of the match in this final, but he's been nearly a man of the match in every game he's been playing in football and in hurling. And then, you know, to just whatever way that ball just popped, like so, sometimes maybe, I don't know, it's written in the stars, like it popped up into his hand above anyone else. You know, when he was back there, uh, like a, I've never seen a throw in just pop up off someone's foot and aisle, uh, And then he cleared it down. And, and I would say, no disrespect to Thurlis Sarsfields, who are very good as well. Like, I mean, every neutral in the country probably jumped up off the couch when that final whistle blew. Oh, definitely. Like we were in the house there watching it and like you were just delighted when the ball like it, it popped up to John McGrath and it was such a present. Like I'd say he's never won an easier ball in his life. Like he just he even had time to sort of just set himself and go then again and when he had the ball running out like it was just everyone in Lockmore knew that was it then like and but the same thing happened a minute earlier when he won the free he was running down along the corner with Paddy Maher and he went to rise the first time and missed it yeah. like and the ball hopped out of his hand and you're thinking geez he's in bother here he's down at the corner flag but whatever way he does it he just buys space for himself and as strong as Paddy Maher is John McGrath kind of just maneuvered him to the wrong side and just held him off without even moving like and he just he has that knack of just getting to where the space is and he n he's never blocked down or anything like that. And I was listening to it on, on, on TG Cahar and the commentary was in Irish and Donald O'Grady says, the, the, com the co-commentator, he was like, this is a tough free now, the, it's, it's out at an angle, he's missed one or two earlier. And Donald O'Grady just said, it's coma, which is, it try like, it doesn't matter, he's going to score. Right. And... Like, I think everyone knew, like, John McGrath, he was, he's, he's so calm, like, and he walked up to the ball, he was just, 
you knew he was going to yeah, score. Yeah, I knew he like, was going to score too. He yeah. wasn't going to miss. Like, and just the whole, like, that was just like more. The, we were talking about it earlier, like, the whole way through the game, Noel McGrath so clever, Lee McGrath so clever, but like, as well as that, there was the fight of lads like John Maher kept going the whole way through. Kieran Connolly in midfield, like he just never stops running. And the last ten minutes, it was just it was just war. Like it was ball going from one end of the field, and it was no real short passing. Like it was just we'll lump it down. Traditional here. stuff, and the referee really? letting everything go too. Like I mean, which added to again, like yeah. it was like a Kenny uh, final, wasn't it? It was very similar to that like Kenny final. Like for the last five minutes, you're thinking there's definitely going to be a free here. Like I just haven't heard the whistle, <laughs> but. It just, the play kept going and the referee, um, Kieran McCormick is his name, he just let them at it and it really added to the spectacle because yeah. the last five minutes of that game, it was just like, if you win a ball here, you know you're going to get absolutely flaked. Like, and yeah. uh, that's the way it was and I think that kind of a game suited Lockmore and brought the best out of him. I did, like, I mean, I finally realised what hurling people say, let it flow. It's so obvious. Let the bloody game flow. I'm going to start saying it now myself. I'm totally on that, um, on that side. Right, enough of us lads, because I spoke with the captain, Lockmore Castellani captain, Noel McGrath, earlier, and I started off by asking him how the head was today. Yeah, all good now, Colin, yeah. All good. We, we're all, we're all night, so we're all fresh and, and happy this morning. You're definitely happy whether you're fresh or not. Um, that's that's up that's up for for debate or not. Come here. I, I saw you. You said yesterday it was your proudest moment um, in your career, captaining uh, the team yesterday. Yeah, look, I suppose they're 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 special days. Like, and we've we've been it's eight years since we won a county final. We can to, to get the honour to go up and do it is is unbelievable. Like, so like you sold her so long with lads to do to do something like that and to eventually achieve it then and, and be the one to go up and, and, and accept the cup on behalf of the boys is, is unreal. So it was a massive day for us all and, and one that for me personally I'll, I'll remember for the rest of my life. The last year's um, finals, the two of them, absolute heartbreak. I think the whole country was feeling for you after the that last minute goal, after you go on the pint up with the 65. Do it like I mean, there was a picture of you doing the rounds. You know, you were crying on the field, and you know, you know, you fast forward a year and you're still crying on the field, but it's <laughs> <laughs> it's for a completely different reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was. It was. It was yeah, it was to- two totally different games and two totally different outcomes, but. Thanks we we were on the right side of it this year because last year was heartbreaking and like you think when that happens that you might never get back there when you're so close like so for it to to happen the way it did over the last two weekends was unreal and we'll we'll definitely remember that for for a while anyway because we all remember the heartbreak we had last year as well so um, to have the the off the field this year is unreal. Yeah, no, it it, def- it definitely is. Did you fancy John to get that free at the end? <laughs> To be honest, I, 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 I can't really, I do, I remember, I remember it all right, but I didn't realise how late it was in the game, I thought there might have been another maybe three or four or five minutes left, so you know, he had been hitting him well all day, I think he missed one or two in the first half, but he's been hitting him well for the last few weeks, so we'd be confident enough in him, um, like he's been, he's been hitting the freeze for all year there and been fairly successful with him, so, but on the pitch I didn't really realise how long we left, so. Um, it, it, I didn't feel as nervous maybe as people sitting in the stand or watching on telly right right okay like I mean for John it was a fairy tale ending because he won that free then he scored it and then I don't know how the hell I think the referee went to throw the ball in after it was a scrum for about 30 seconds and then he threw the ball in it must have hit someone's boot and popped up into his <laughs> popped up into his hand yeah the boy said that it just hit out someone's knee or early and just flew straight into his hand and he cleared it away like but like how easy that could have went the other way and flew into his arse yeah. that hand like so it's just a small margin but we were delighted to see someone coming out with it red and green anyway and, and clearing it out well, What are you thinking in those moments at the end especially after what happened last year like I mean is that going through your mind or is it like Jesus we could get caught here or are you trying to stay positive and confident that you close it out I don't think you have time to think about that like <laughs> it's just it's just it's just so much going on in that period of time like when we were four or five up and then we can see their goal and got them back into it and next minute their level like so it's you don't really have time to think what's going on and I don't you don't realise what left time wise or anything like that so I don't know what's going through our heads but that's it's just hoping the ref will blow the whistle and it'll be all over how how like I mean are you always in these games that go down to the wire whether it's football or hurling I like number one you have a slow start number two you make a big comeback and number three it's going to be a completely nerve wracking finish 
Yeah, I think some of our supporters will be giving out to us that we, <laughs> we're going to give some of my heart attack if one of these days the way it's going. But I don't know like whether it's look at this stage of the championship. Every team you play is going to be fairly good. Like, and you're not going to win any matches by too much. Like, so thankfully we've come the right side. And if you, like as you said, like last year we were on the other side, and but we're up against two serious teams as well. Like, so. It, all the games and if you look around the county uh, country and any county finals and that the, the results at this end of the year are very tight like so um, I'm sure there's plenty of games that went to extra time and replays as well yeah no they, they definitely have you talked about your slow starts to games is that because you're on the road every weekend and there, you might have to shake a kind of rustiness out of the legs um, I'm not really sure to be honest. Like I suppose the last few weeks we've have had a slow start in, in both the hurling and the football, but I, I don't really know if you can put it down to Anton really like um I suppose w- once we're once we're able to stick in the game, like and I think in the drawing game especially, we just held ourselves in there in that last ten minutes of the first half and gave ourselves a chance because they were, that was a stage where the game could have got away from us. Like so we just to have that in as a sports we're an experienced team like whereas seven eight nine years ago things like that might have games might have got away from us and teams might have went from six or seven up to maybe 10 or 11 up and the game is over then like so i think we've just learned like and lads have the experience of playing and know that we have it in the bodies to keep going for the 60 minutes yeah how are you managing the 18 is it 18 you're at now weekends in a row of of, of championship like how are you managing um, it how, how do you plan the how do you plan the week um, look, I suppose we 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 train for whatever code we're playing at the weekend. Like so, like we go train. We train most Tuesdays or Wednesday nights, whichever. If the match is on a Sunday, we train Wednesday. If it's on a Saturday, we did, we train the Tuesday. And then depending what whether what day it's on, the following weekend we mightn't train at all, or we might train on the Friday night. Like so, it's just it's just it's managed well in fairness by the management, like and that, and they're they know how much to do on any given night like and that keeps us fresh like and when you're changing from hurling to the football like people think of it as a negative at times but it keeps us fresh for both codes like when right. we go back to playing hurling after a football week we haven't played hurling for eight or nine days like and lads are just mad for hurling then and same when it comes to the football like you'll be looking forward to it because you haven't played it in over a week like so it's, it keeps things fresh like and then there's a swap over of players as well, the lads that maybe haven't played in the football are going to play in the hurling and haven't played in the in the hurling are going to play in the football and that keeps them fresh as well and everybody drives it on like and that gives everyone energy then as well when there's lads coming in looking mad to play like and just want to get on the pitch. Yeah. So what did the lads? What did the lads do? do you, most of you played the duel, though, don't, don't you? Like I mean, there's what there's only like one or two that might come in fresh to, to freshen it up. Yeah, like we, everybody trains for both. Like nobody doesn't do one or the other. Like everybody's there every night of the week training. Like, but um, oh. like it's it's just I suppose everyone wants to play the part whatever way they can, and everybody is doing that. And like whatever you're asked to do, you go do it. So there's there's as I said, like from since we were eight or nine, like that's that's the way our club works. Even if you see it now at the moment, like the juveniles train for hurling and football, sometimes even on the same day. Like so, we we've been just used to, it. and I think people probably make a bigger deal of it outside of our club as 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 probably we do because it's just the way it is. Like you you look at the history of our club, like in the fifties and sixties. I don't know if there was any hurling being played in the in the club. Like it was all football. So that's that's where we've come from the club, like as a football club back in the 50s, 60s, and hurling kind of got going in the late 70s and early 80s. So it's 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 that's what our club was built on, I suppose, and we're just delighted to be able to keep that tradition going. Yeah, when you you, start, you, you definitely are. Like I mean, there, there's there's uh, people send me messages and you hear different stories, like club managers discouraging players from playing both, and even some clubs have a policy of discouraging, you know, football or over hurling or hurling over football. Like you, you're very clear evidence. Slot Nail to Crat Low have done it that it is possible. Like I mean, you know, like this probably sounds very strange to you coming from the club that you, that you're from. That any club or any manager would discourage it. Yeah, like, look, we obviously have heard them stories, like, from different clubs in different places, like, and, but I suppose for us ourselves, over the last 10 or 12 years, we've, we have the same manager for both hurling and football, which I think is the biggest, the biggest thing that you need to do, because 
that means then that there's no conflict of interest that that manager wants both teams to do well like and is able yeah. to manage the players they have to manage the training and there's no arguing between one manager and another then as to who trained this night or who plays this night or whatever like and I think that's that's massive for us like is that everybody is in everybody that's involved is interested in both teams and wants the two teams to do well like whereas if you have two separate managers obviously they're going to want their players on, on any given night like and that's natural as well like but I think it just that just works for us in, in Lockmore Castellini anyway and thankfully it seems to be working alright at the moment anyway Jeez, it is. It definitely is working. Come here, we were talking on the show last week about how you were going to manage the week between the football and the hurling, and we were saying, would they even go for a pint? And I was saying, it's the, probably the only time I'd ever maybe understand them not being allowed to have a pint after a county final, considering how long you're on the go and the hurling. What, what, how did you celebrate the football? Well, to be honest, uh, Colin, like, it, the reason we do it is to enjoy it. Like, so after the football, we had a few pints like out and out and back out and not more like because if, if like I seen your clip all right on Twitter and kind of few lads were kind of laughing at it and saying God if they only knew like but we definitely <laughs> went for a few points like because that's why you do it like and to enjoy it and I think if you went home after a match like that you probably wouldn't sleep anyway so I yeah. don't think a couple of points and a bit of crack was going to do much harm at that stage and I suppose if we got bet yesterday there'd be people saying what were we doing but. When we didn't, it, it, it worked, and I think there are small things that people make a big deal of at times. I, I think like if you win a county final at any level, it's well earned. So you need to celebrate it and enjoy it, and we did, and we'll we'll celebrate and enjoy this one now as well. You must you must have a, an unbelievable team spirit in that you're all on the go non-stop, uh, and you're winning together as well. Yeah, look, I suppose you're spending so much time with lads, like it it, it creates a great bond and. A great energy with with everyone and like we're all kind of have come up along growing up together there's different groups that would have played together from under 12 up along to senior like and we've all blended in together like over the last number of years I suppose it's not just this year but over the last five six seven years even when we weren't winning like but we're, we're like it's a small enough place like everybody knows everybody and like we all enjoy each other's company we've plenty of rows and arguments at time too and that's all part of it but at the end of the day like we, we're all friends and we all get on with it and when we win we, we enjoy it and when we don't we, we still get on with it and, and we back each other and, and we enjoy each other's company whether that's on or off the field I, I see you needed a leash man to get you over the line as well I saw Mick Dempsey out in the field there yeah, he, he, he's been helping us out already. I think they, your number wasn't ringing tonight. They were ringing. They wanted someone from Leash to come down and give us a hand. <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah, no, Mick, Mick, has been, Mick has been very good with us there in the last while. He's a great experience like from his time with Kilkenny and in Carlo IT and many different teams. Like So, look, every little helps. Like, and he, he has been a good help and it has blended in with the management very well. And I suppose... The plus with Mick coming as well was that while his Mick's name was probably made with the Kilkenny Hurling team, I think Mick's background is in football with his club and leash. So, yeah, I suppose he, whether he understood what he was getting himself into with the two codes going hand in hand, I, I think now he's 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 seen that it has worked for us anyway, and he's played a part in that as well. And and uh, hopefully over the next few weeks he'll play another part in it. Yeah, Mick, Dem- Mick Dempsey gave me my debut senior football in 1998, so he did. So I always have a oh, have very a, good have good memories of Mick. He obviously played I, with. I, I'll, with ask him, I'll ask him. <laughs> during the week what you were like. <laughs> I had a brilliant, I had a, ma- I had a brilliant debut actually. Yeah, the next game not so oh, good, but good. the debut, the debut, uh, uh, the debut went well. That's the way it works. Drinks and roundabouts. Exactly. Come here, you were on the yeah. go since 2007 with Lockmore Castellani. Like, I mean, it's it's hard to believe you were 16 years old when you won the county final and you won the Munster that year. Like, I mean, are you the only one finished or still going from then? Like, um, like this is just a completely new team. No, there's, there's three lads that played yesterday and another involved with us over the, over the last few years that were involved. So myself, Kieran McGrath and Evan Sweeney were all playing in 07. David Kendi was playing in 07 and he's still with us there every night at training and was our goalie last year in the hurl and like so he's given serious service to his club and hardly ever missed a training even now at the moment like I, I don't know what David is I don't know what age he is he's 40 something so yeah the four of us have been there since then like and like it's, it's great to have that still going 
Yeah, no, it definitely. Well, I have to say before I let you go, the club is getting great coverage. Like, I mean, you couldn't buy this kind of marketing, you know, like, I mean, everybody, I think everybody just, I think everybody remembers the images from last year, how you've been able to bounce back the fact you're a dual club. You know, do you, do you, do you notice the attention that the, that the club is getting? Ah, look, you do, Colin, there's no point in saying you don't. Like, we're all on social media, we're all on Twitter and Instagram and that, and you see the different things on it. Like, but I suppose it's like, that's all great and that, but we got all the claps in the back last year, even though we had won nothing. And I suppose we, we kind of said this year over the last few weeks, we were close again, and we didn't want to get all the claps in the back. We've been great, lads, for getting close again, like, because you want to win when you get so close to finals, like, so. Like people give us great support and it's very much appreciated. Like from inside the club and outside the club, and like that's 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 what makes it, I suppose, for us. And we're happy to be able to just give them something to celebrate. Like we all know at the moment, there's a lot of doom and gloom over different things. Like and so to have this, we have to give our parish a lift, and hopefully people that were even looking on from outside give them a lift as something that they can enjoy. Like it's nearly December at this stage and the year is nearly gone but people are still in great spirits and um, hopefully this will keep people in good spirits because you could, you could get down very easy if you believe everything that's going on out there in the world at the moment so you have to live a life too and enjoy it as best you can well that's it that's it and you're not you're still going to be enjoying life because I'm sure today you'll have a good day and obviously then out next week against a rogue in the Munster football um, championship and then a small task of heading to Walsh Park to play Ballygunner the week after the week after yeah yeah so two big weekends coming up again but look I suppose we, we'll enjoy this week this yesterday's uh, result now today and we wake up tomorrow morning and whether lads will whether lads will be fit enough or fresh enough to think about next weekend tomorrow we'll wait and see but come Wednesday night when we get back to the field we'll, we'll get the focus on again for, for next weekend and what an opportunity like just to, to go somewhere different like and go play I've heard a few matches in it but I've definitely never kicked the football down there so that's <laughs> going to be something that'll be interesting for us all and, and we're all looking forward to it as well like and that'll be another another great day out for us and hopefully that um, we'll, we'll give a good account of ourselves and represent Tipperary as best we can in both coaches Last question before I let you go. Has anyone ever showed up to hurling training and without their hurl thinking it was a football training session? Uh, it has happened at times, yeah, it has happened at times. <laughs> or they uh, have no hurley. And <laughs> yes, but I think um, since the, it happened a few times a couple of years ago, all right, but since that, I think people have learned just bring them all, Rich, and <laughs> then whichever is, whichever is going on is going on. So um, uh, during this, when the matches are going, you know, the midweek, what is, what's trend is going to be, like whether it's hurling or football. But um I think John said a few years ago about Hurley's, Hurley's and our slitters maybe thrown in in the middle of a football session or something like that. But I don't think it's as crazy as that over there. No. But, um, we, we, we hopefully think that we're, we're getting on all right with the way we're going anyway. You definitely are. Noah, come here. Thanks very much for giving us your time this morning and enjoy the celebrations today. Thanks, Colin. Thanks very much. So there you are now, Lee. There's confirmation that they'd go for points after the football match. We were wondering what the hell's going on. What would they do? Um, they went for points and as Noel said and he's dead right I suppose if you go home after a game like that you're not going to sleep anyways you're as well off to have the few have the bit of closure on it the chat around it and um, you know what's the point in winning it if you can't have the couple of points no that's it now we've all got a sound bite that we could fire back to our managers <laughs> for future references like sure they did it and they went and they won the the double as well. We're probably not even drinking enough as a club. You know, we've got to bring back <laughs> this drinking culture, you know, because we care about success and recovery and team bonding and things like that. So now I finally got uh, a case study, you know, that I can point to and actually say, look, it works. You know, it definitely give us give us the pints. <laughs> yeah, we're not drinking enough as a club, lads. That's the that's the <laughs> speech that we, we're having. But that's the thing, like, I mean, they're, they're busting the myth of the jewel and I think that's bloody brilliant. And a lot of players can now say, could say to a manager, not just managers around the country that are, let's just say, discouraging it. Clubs are discouraging it, which is just beyond belief. There is a very simple example of saying, look, hang on a second. Look what they are able to do. I think it's, in, I think it's absolutely inspirational. And that's why, everybody that's why everybody loves them. Going for a few points after a football match, after being on the road seven, 17 weeks <coughs> in a row with a hurling final the week after, they easily could have decided to go home you know like they're doing things the right way and winning now 
They are, yeah. It's just it's kind of like they're just doing it to, as Noel said in the interview, they're doing it to enjoy it. Like, and you can see by the way they sort of die for each other on the field that they've enjoyed. Ev- like, it's not just the playing together; it's celebrating together, winning together, losing together. They do everything together. And you know, like when they win a county final, they they were never going to go home. Like I know we were kind of we were half debating it, but like when you really think about it, they were never going to go home. And you know, a qu- like a, a, a an early night, like after after winning something like that. And I just say I'd say like more Castellani. It's only a small little parish in Mid Tipperary, but it must be absolutely hopping these last few weeks because yesterday Frankie McGrath, the Lockmore manager, his daughters were part of the, and there was seven eight, seven or eight other girls from Lockmore on the Drum and Inch team that won the Munster Senior Camogie Championship. They won the Tipperary Senior Camogie Championship the week before. Like, and right. like half of them are, like, uh, nearly, nearly all the, I think it's 12 of the starting team on the Lockmore, they're related and all the girls are related. And it's just like, uh, everyone, they're, they're winning together and uh, they're, all, they're doing it the right way, aren't they? It's, great t- it's a great time <laughs> to be alive in Lockmore, Castellani, and definitely the whole country is talking about them. The profile of the club has gone through the roof. Not always, not to everybody's liking, but it was, I thought it was the Turles manager. I think he's a Turles selector. Brendan Carroll was interviewed on TG Caherley before the game and he said, everyone's hyping up Lockmore. We're a bit sick of it at the minute, listening to it. Like, I mean, I'd say Turles used the whole country rooting for Lockmore Castellani, you know, to motivate themselves because they started, they started the game really well and they're like, listen, lads, you know, geez, this is sickening you, this going on about this crowd, you know. I'd say that's what they were saying. No, it has to be. Yeah, I mean, your your whole plan was to go in and upset the whole party. Let's ruin the whole thing and make it about us. And you know, I mean, they're right to go in with that attitude as well. It must be really like you went in a brilliant adventure yourself. You know, went in the quarterfinal, the semifinal, you got yourself to the final, drew the last one, um, putting on a brilliant performance, and they were fantastic as well. Like, I mean, they were really up for it. So for everyone outside of your camp to be against you, like. You know, they should talk to Jerome about the siege mentality thing and see how it can bring them <laughs> forward because that's that's what they needed to do. And, and like they came close in the end, but you, you just couldn't stop the story that was um, like Casalari's story this year, like the narrative of everything with John McGrath and all. Like I mean, they they were an unstoppable juggernaut this year, and like they had to do it, and and they did, and we couldn't be happier for it. Yeah, exactly. The chip championship as well is a big winner in this um, Niall. The drawn match. This one, again, referee letting it flow. Great spectacles on the television. Everyone talking about it. Um, the last five years, Turles Sarsfields, Clonolty, Boris Ali, Kiladangan and Lockmore. Five different winners in five years. A lot of them on the telly and a lot of them classic matches too. Yeah, like, and in fairness to Turles Sarsfields, like, they played their part in that being such a thriller yesterday as well. Like, because yeah. as, as we said there earlier, it was only the, the hop of that ball, like, uh, that broke to John McGrath. If that if that had broke to a Turles lad, they could have been in there. Like it was that tight, and it was end to end the whole way through. And I suppose it is it is a sign of how competitive the Tipperary Championship is. Five winners in the last five years, and watching that watching that game as as a Tipperary hurling supporter, like you'd be proud to say that that is the championship, and those are the best two teams. That, that, that are in Tipperary yeah because that's it because Kiladangan won the final in dramatic circumstances like we're talking about when Boris Ali won it they were involved in loads of brilliant matches too weren't they so like I mean you're going very well in Tipperary one other question I wanted to ask you I saw our own Paddy Stapleton <laughs> tweeting about Dennis Marr he said is Dennis Marr going to get a run for Tipperary now or what injury and work were the only things holding him back in prior years if he was in his mid-twenties we'd be saying he's nailed on for full forward next year. How old is he? He's a big lump of a full forward. This would take a, a, this would take a change in direction to be playing him, probably, wouldn't it, for Tipperary? Yeah, I, th- I think he's 32 or 33, Dennis Maher. Like, he was the, the Turles captain yesterday. And, like, in fairness, the, the, the semi-final, I'd watched their semi-final as well. And from there, the, the final replay, or the drawn game and the replay, the whole way through, he was just that focal point for Turles Arsfields. Like, they hit the ball in on him. And he's he's so skillful. He's a great lad to win the ball, and he just knows what to what to do when he gets the ball. Like he played for Tipperary before. I'd say it was around maybe twenty eleven until maybe twenty fourteen, and he was di- like he was he was a good hurler. Did well in different league games. Never really broke through. Like I, he played a few championship games. Never really like made like a, a fixed place on the team for himself. Right. But he's such a brilliant stick man and such a brilliant player of hands such a clever hurling brain that he'd definitely be an addition like you know he, he he's pr- he's 32 or 3 now he probably lacks a small bit of pace but I think he, he probably he was never the quickest but right. as Paddy said he's just such a such a target man and such a clever hurler 
that he'd be he'd be an asset if he was injured, you know. Right. We'll keep our eye out. Maybe Colin Bonner might want to go with a, a maybe a more direct uh, game plan or something like that. Although he's he's got a, an embarrassment of riches um, up front. The other county champions crowned yesterday are Saint Finbar's fourteen, um, Clonakilty thirteen. I was sent a DM on Twitter telling me never to call them Saint Finbar's again. They're the bars. The Bars boy. So we're going to call them the Bars now. They won. They won, the, they won it in 2018 as well. Lee, you were watching this at the Irish Examiner uh, live stream that I actually didn't get to see it. Yeah, yeah. It was on a, like a YouTube stream. It was very good. Um, yeah, the, the Bars. <laughs> That's their 10th Cork title now. Um, it was an interesting game, especially because they actually got off to quite a slow start. It took them, I think, 12 minutes before they registered a score at all. Uh, Clonic Kilty, or I think, were a point to the good at that stage. But... Um, the Bars goalkeeper, uh, John Kearns, had made two excellent saves at that point as well. I mean, they could have easily been 2-1 up to nothing within 12 minutes. And then after that, although the scoreline always stayed within sort of touching distance and Clonic Guilty were putting a good account of themselves up front, like uh, the, the majority of attack and play was definitely in, in favour of the Bars. And if you only need to look at sort of the wides count for that, I mean, I think they hit nine wides and Clonic Guilty had only hit the two, you know, so that shows you that they sort of had the the chunk of the chances and they were just a little bit braver going forward and um at the day in seconds uh the clown of Kilty goalkeeper um uh, white mark white he yeah. uh he had uh, you know it was a very difficult chance in fairness to him and he actually struck it well but it, it's he hit it and you're like oh it's not going to make it over this would have been to equalize the game um but then it sort of looked like it may drop short fall into the full forward lane and we could see some sort of last minute uh disaster and from a bar's point of view but and it, it, it went just wide in the end, and it's a cruel way for it to end from uh, their point of view. But yeah, a, a decent county final for sure. Yeah, Mark White, he's got a huge booming kick out anyways. He was the Cork goalkeeper for a few years. I don't think he was last year um, or the year before. He's a booming kick out. So I would have reckoned that the, the distance wasn't a problem for him. Um, it just uh, faded to the right. They, they were down on the field afterwards, and I was singing Alley Le Blues. This, this is the song they sing. They're obviously... Uh, Tugged out all in blue. It's something you boys in Laura could uh, could borrow if you want. Allez le, le bleu, the French uh, the French crowd sing it at the rugby. Yeah, all we need to do is win a championship now. <laughs> we'd, be, we'd, be allowed to, we'd be allowed to sing it and stop getting relegated and that kind of thing. But <laughs> yeah. uh, in fairness to you, if, if, if you're calling a club by their name and you're still getting called out by lads on Twitter, I don't know, I don't know how can you win. Cause I'm calling them the perfect name written down in front of me, St. Finbars, and I'm getting shit over that. It's the Bars. They're, Come obviously, on. they're obviously a bit of a cult like when they've that Alley Le Bleu thing going as well. And that's the bars and all this, like, but sure, I suppose, as we were talking about last week, they're kind of an iconic club, aren't they? And yeah. uh, the, the one in 2018, it was their first title in 33 years, so they've gone through an awful drought. They were relegated into the intermediate around 2007. Michael Shields came on yesterday, and he was around for that relegation, and they lost a couple of finals, then won it for the first time in 33 years in, in 2018, and now have retained it, have a young team. So it'll be interesting to see how, it'll be interesting to see how they get on. They play... Um, the last time they played in the Munster Club when they won it in 2018 they were destroyed by Dr Crokes now Dr Crokes were at their height with that great team they had um, in around there it was 520 to 111 so they really need to you know th there's no Dr Crokes this year Austin Stacks or Kearns or Atlees probably be manageable enough Lockmore Castellani would be good as well I think they play Lockmore Castellani um, yeah, I now, think it is. I think that's the who winner is. of Lockmore and Ennis. Yeah, plays Lockmore and Ennis. Players, yeah, yeah, that's Aerog and Ennis. So, like, I mean, they they re the Bears really need to redeem themselves because, like, a team with such the history they have, like we were saying last Thursday, nine county titles, three All Irelands, like to be humiliated in Munster by the Kerry champions for the Bears. You know, like, I mean, they're definitely, I'm sure, be going out. Even Ian McGuire said after the game, he said it's our tradition to carry on now. We're not looking at the 80s team. We're looking at this team. So, like, I mean, that's it. The tradition's there. We don't want the repeat of, of 2018. I'm sure, they're, I'm sure they're really targeting doing well in Munster now. Yeah, well, when they won, when they won in 2018, it was probably, it was, that was the end of the famine. You know, yeah. maybe they did, like, you, you kind of think that is, we've, we've got to the promised land now. And, you know, it can be hard to get it going again. But Ian Maguire, he was the captain in 2018 as well and captain again and man of the match yesterday. And he's so car captain too. Obviously, like uh, he's kind of the talisman and the man that's bringing Finbars forward. And just having interviewed him before as, uh, and hearing what he's saying there, he'd be a great man to sort of lead them. And I'd say they will be much more focused this time around when they get into Munster. Like. Yeah, Clonakilty had a nice little touch before, their, before the match. Their 1996 um, championship winning team footballers lined the corridor in Porky Keeve. We, we, know, we know obviously the, 
the Porky Keeve is like a mini um, a mini Croke Park so you can you can picture the tunnel like when you'd see you know the dubs coming out through it they were lined up along it um, Lee to clap the boys out and slap them on the back and stuff like that. The Clonic Hilti, to be fair to them, they were well in that game, only lost by a point. They were three to one outsiders, and like we mentioned Friday, Lima Donovan wasn't playing. So, again, they'd have a lot to kind of, you know, be proud of and build on. No, for sure. Yeah, I mean, they definitely made a great account of themselves, particularly because, you know, they'd only lost two games this season, and both of them were to the bars this year. So, they and one of them was, was, a, was a very good hammer in as well. Like, I mean, they were well beaten. So for them to come out and be competitive all the way through, you know, they equalised really late in the game in injury time. Yeah. And you're sort of thinking the momentum might swing their way. But um, the bars, see, Stephen Sherlock, like he was, he was well marked that game, but he scored seven points, still three from play, and he got the winning score. You know, it, he was just on form this entire championship. He, he finished the championship season with, uh, I think it was 341. You know, it was a very decent return. And, you know, he's, he's good on the dead ball and he's excellent, like, you know, like in terms of pressure, cool last kick of the game, you know, the big scores, he steps up in them situations. And for him to get score lines like that and still not get man of the match because Ian Maguire was just colossal in midfield. And then their goalkeeper, as I mentioned earlier, John Cairns for the bars, you know, it, it, keeping the two goals out. Like if either of them two goals had it went in, we could have had a completely different game on our hands. But then just in fairness, the bars, you know, from their last line of defence to their focal point in attack, they were just that little bit stronger in depth and they got three in the end. Yeah. Clock Balakala beat Rapparees on Saturday night. This was on RT, so they got over Willie Dunphy's stag <laughs> anyways. They didn't go too uh, mental because they were, they were in good form. Like, I mean, I was watching this. It, it was the little purple patch just before half time that played against the Rapparees, had the wind in the first half, 8 4 up. And Clock Balakala got the last four points of the half, going 8 all, and then they have the wind in the second half. And Clock Balakala are a good second half team. They had been in the least championship anyways. So the kind of uh, the writing was on the wall maybe for Rapparees. Um, that was Clock Balakala's first ever win in the Leinster club, which sounds, you know, incredible. But they're only a new club, and this was their only this was only their third attempt in the Leinster club. So it's not, you know, stats can be misleading sometimes now. Yeah, exactly. Like it was with twenty minutes gone in that game, and Rapparees eight points to four up. You're nearly thinking Clock Balakala in a bit bother here, like. But and those when a team scores before half time. Whether they're losing or whether they're ahead, it, they're such important scores to get because it just it completely changed the game there. Yeah, on Your Saturday tails night. are off. The uh, the mood in the dressing room is completely different. Completely, yeah, and you could see it. Even the scores that they got, the scores they got were brilliant. Like the one, Willie Highland scored one. He barely even looked, and he he was hitting it. It was a beautiful point, like from the middle of the field, and he played his part in setting up one as well. It was a brilliant score they got. Someone hit the ball to him. He hit it across. And the corner forward in and got a lovely point as well. And that just completely changed the game from for, for, for Clock Balakala. And like going in at half time, like having been four points down, getting it back to level, you knew they were going the momentum was with them then coming out in the second half. And they never really looked back from there. Like rapparees were, were a little bit flat in the second half, but like I suppose the fact they hadn't played in nine weeks kind of helped them. Well, that's it. I'll talk talk about that in a minute. But Picky Mar's goal was a lovely little goal, wasn't it? And you mentioned Willie Highland's point. He wasn't even. He took a pass and he wasn't even looking at the goals. He just knew where they were. Like he's a Rolls Royce type player, um, in midfield. You have Willie Dunphy, you have Bergen in the corner who are hard to handle. Willie Dunphy, I'm a huge fan. Like he's all action. He wears his heart in his sleeve. Even Cheddar said on the show here. Um, when he was on it he doesn't know how he's still playing his knees are completely gone he doesn't know how he's walking he doesn't know how he's walking and Willie Duffy's still doing it for Leash and for for Clock Balakala. he's such a feisty character there was one stage in the first half I think it was Ricky Fox gave him a little snig after he was clearing the ball down the line and Willie Dunphy turned around and he was fit to, like he was fit to row like and any time any defender gives him like steps on his toes even just a small bit like Willie Dunphy gives it back to them twice as hard, and I'd say it's that sort of mindset, that sort of uh, like mental toughness, like that just brings him through and even gets him, allows him to play when his knees are in such a bad yeah. way. Like. He's marrying a physio, which might not come as a surprise. <laughs> yeah, I'd say she'll have her work cut out with him anyway. <laughs> she plenty of pra- plenty of practice. There's no doubt there. So Lee Nile mentioned rapparees. Like I mean, this is a serious disadvantage. Now I, it, we are accepting the fact that we're going to talk about Bally Gunner in a minute, who had an eight week break and they won well. Now, Rapparees had a nine-week break. Like, for me, the Wexford County Board are not doing their county champions any favours. You're coming up against the Clock Balakala team who have played, won a county title up to two weeks ago, are on that roll, momentum, confidence, and you have a situation where Rapparees are sitting there for nine weeks. 
it can't be an advantage because you know like I mean there's a big problem with teams when they win the provincial club and then there's like a 12 week break to the all Ireland club and all that momentum's lost but at least that's the same for both teams that are playing those all Ireland semi-finals and every player every manager talks about how hard that is that break is and how to manage it Wexford County Board are giving their cha- county champions that obstacle while the county champions they're facing will not have that obstacle like Wexford need to when you see Lockmore Castellani playing 18 weekends in a row you hear Noel McGrath saying he loves playing hurling one week and then he's back to playing football the next week and he's missed the football because he hasn't played it in a week and now it's all fresh and new and this is Noel McGrath and they're all saying the same thing they love the week on off week on off Wexford have ripped that up they think it's a much better idea to play hurling all on its own first and then football all on its own I don't think that's the right policy at all. I think it was brought in around COVID maybe for some reason. And I remember even their chairman was bragging about how successful it was. That is not right. It's not good enough for your county champions to have to have that obstacle uh, put in front of them. No, I think it worked out like 10 weeks in the end that they were or near enough. That, you know, that, yeah, I mean, that that's, that's just outrageous. Like you're basically starting a whole new season in terms of like when you finish a county final and you've got to that point, your body has just peaked. You know, like you, because you—that's what you've been preparing for. You've reached like that athletic uh, peak in your season. So what comes after that is inevitably some form of a drop, and then that drop, and you need to get it to build it back up again. And ten weeks is like with no able to really get friendlies and challenge games, and mentally, you know, trying to drag yourself into go to training when you know you, oh God, sure, it's not the game's not for another eight weeks, it's not for another six weeks, it's not for another month, you know, like, you know, it, it just drags on and on, and you know you've got it hanging above you, you don't even know who you're playing specifically until two weeks before, it's a huge, huge disadvantage, And but strangely enough, I would have thought that with the long layoff, that the danger for rapperies going into the game would be that it takes them too long to get involved, they start really slowly, and then the game sort of chases away from or falls away from them, but it was sort of the opposite that happened, they actually managed a very decent start, and they couldn't keep the momentum or the tempo up long enough too. So if it's any clue at all, it would say something down to match conditioning really. And and that just comes with playing games, which obviously they weren't. Yeah, they had a wind as well in the first half, which probably helped their, which helped a good start. Because then we got on Bally Gunner, the, almost the opposite. See, Bally Gunner liked, they had eight weeks and uh, Rapparees had 10. Bally Gunner had a few injuries in that county final. They were Their manager said afterwards that the eight weeks was very, very good for us. There was a lot of guys injured in the county final eight weeks ago. Four of them playing today and three of them probably took injections to play in that match. So the break has really stood us in that regard. They got players back. Now, we were we were wondering last week how how you even um you know fill that eight weeks so they took they, you were suggesting the first two weeks off that's what Bally Gunner did they gave them two weeks off Dara was saying we gave them two weeks off and went back at it the first challenge we played was against Sarsfields of Cork and they gave us a trimming but they were playing the following week in the championship and we weren't playing for another six or seven weeks so they gave them two weeks off then played Sarsfields got destroyed and then kind of tried to build it up for the last month again now I would argue Bally Gunner are just way better than everybody. You know, they won that. I still think that eight weeks was a disadvantage to Bally Gunner if you didn't take, you know, if you didn't take the injuries clearing up um, into the consideration. I say the thing about Bally Gunner is that they were nearly focused on the Munster Club from the start anyway. Do you know, like they, like they're so, like it's, is it eight or nine in eight. a row they've won in Waterford yeah. now that they're just, like Waterford isn't even, like winning a county final for them isn't the biggest thing. Like I'd say they weren't even, like they, they're obviously hur- hurling like at their a, a, as well as they can, but I'd say that they, they, they're at the back of their minds they're thinking like we're going to have a run at this monster club. They probably saw that there was a eight or nine the eight or nine week gap that there was going to be, but they'd have kind of been mentally prepared for that. And I'd say like you know they've never won the All Ireland club before, and they seem they seem like men on a mission this year. Like and I'd say Rapparees, you know when they won the hur- they won the Wexford, and it was the first one in a long time when they won the Wexford County title. So they probably hadn't taken it into account at all about, you know, that they're going to have this 10-week gap until Leinster. Probably hadn't even thought about Leinster. Just Ballygunner were, would have been slightly more prepared for it. like. But, yeah, the, the move in Wexford, they, they, hur- they play the Hurling Championship first and then the football. Yeah. And in Waterford, same thing. They're, same the only, thing. they're the only two counties doing I think that. think Carlow might do something similar as well. But, they, like I'd say, it was brought in with the kind of the best intentions of kind of, you know... It would. I think it was just a clear case of overthinking it, isn't it? Like yeah. you get one done first and one, like because players, 
when they're when they're in championship mode, as the Lockmore boys keep saying, like it doesn't really matter if it's hurling or football. Like you're going to be sharp either way, and the change sure that's uh, the change will only freshen you up, as Noel McGrath has been saying. Like so, I think they just overthought it in in Wexford and Waterford because it didn't do uh, the Wexford boys justice there. No, and I think they need to they, re- they need to re-examine um, that both Waterford and Wexford because the, you know they're they're outliers now by the looks of things. You say Carlo might be doing it incredibly. Desi Hutchinson didn't score out of three twenty, so I don't know um, how that's even possible. Kilmacud Crokes. Uh, beat Rah- Raharney. Um, Ronan Hayes got two early goals. He was obviously the hero. Did a lot of Riot or over stuff. He was the hero in the county final, obviously. Um, you know, we kind of want him to burst into life. Conal Keeney, um, Niall always t- talks him up on the show saying, you know, you want to see this lad in club hurling in, Dub- in Dublin. And then I remember Paddy Stapen said, Con, yeah, but that's club. It's a big step up to Inter County. And like, I mean, Paddy is right and Connell is right. But we do need to see Ronan Hayes doing this at inter-county level now because there is something there. Oh, Dublin definitely, like, they need him. Like, in fairness to him, he was going well this year and he, it was such a huge loss for them in the in the Leinster final because he was one of the four boys that missed it because of COVID, like. And yeah. He had been showing it this year. He played well that day against Galway when they beat him in the Leinster semi-final and he's kind of just been coming into his own gradually. And this year in the club, like, sure, that day against Kilmacud, he was unreal and it was the same yesterday. Two goals inside 20 minutes. And by the sounds of it, there were just these typical Ronan Hayes goals as well. He's so strong, so fast. He beats his man, like he just kind of holds him off. And he's the pace then to burn someone and the skill to finish it as well. Like, cause, like I think I said it two, two weeks ago, if you're to build a hurler, like this lad has it all. Like So Dublin kind of have been maybe crying out for a lad like him. And I'd say it's only a matter of time before he kind of makes his mark for Dublin like yeah relentless running um, Kieran Dowling his manager kind of described that's what he does he's constantly on the move and he's starting to score a little bit heavier now which is what Dublin um, you know will be looking for no dressing room still in Mulligar this game was in Mulligar Lee like I mean uh, it, like it's just a head scratcher now we, we, we've, we've covered this enough without going back into it we know that Westmead or the, the Westmead County Board the official guidance from Croke Park is is COVID certs only vaccinated people allowed to use the restroom now? Every county in the country is turning a blind eye to that, and rightly so. It's feckin' minus three in Port Leash the other night. Like, give me a break. And it, it would have been fr- it's freezing here today. It's freezing yesterday. Like they're following it to the letter of the law and saying we don't want to discriminate and leave some lads outside, and that's understandable to a point. I said just forget, just just don't pay any he- heed to it. Just let the, let them in. Let them get warm. Let them get a shower. It's, this is cruel. Chemical Crokes brought their own tent or their own gazebo or whatever down, sponsored by Bank of Ireland. Um, <laughs> fair play to the big Dublin clubs. You know, just in case it rained. This is bonker stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely reached like party levels when you've had to set up your own tent as a changing room <laughs> right next to the changing room. Do you know I, mean? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. Sorry, a dressing room. That's my northern dialect coming through. Um, but like it, it's it, yeah, it's, it's beyond farcical at this stage. There's nothing else you can really say about it. And, and the GAA, no. I think, have missed the trick in the sense that they should have just been open and said that open them a little bit earlier, like last October, even the end of September. They should have just they should have made that decision, and then they would be open now. Because now, when it's coming up to Christmas, and you know the media is a lot more filled with COVID-related stories and cases, and hospitals are full and things like that, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for them to publicly come out and just say that it's open. You know, they should have done it a, a couple of months ago and it would have reached the stage and no one would be saying that all oh, the reason for all these high cases or, or hospitals being filled is because of dressing rooms and, and GAA matches. Like, I mean, no one was going to be making that argument. So it's it's just, I don't know, it's one after the other with it, really. It doesn't, it begs belief. Yeah, no, it definitely does. But sure, I suppose there's not too much more we can say about this. Westmead are just sticking to their guns. Hopefully there's no more bloody games there anyways. That's... uh. That's that's all you could hope for. Their their county championships are over, and now they're out. Oh, Lomans, wherever they play Port Harlington, I don't think that's in. Uh, I don't think that's in um, in in Mullingar. I don't think that's in Cusick Park. Thankfully for 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 both teams. Um, championship draws were on this weekend. But I suppose the only place to start Lee is the Ulster Championship because that's the most interesting one, and it's a good draw. Like it's a good draw for the neutral. Thrown preliminary one could have been better. Thrown for Mana. Um, so Tyrone have to win four matches to win Ulster uh, this year. But the quarterfinals thrown up some great games. Derry versus Tyrone, potentially. Donegal, Armagh. Not a nice draw for Armagh, who are trying to build. 
Antrim Cavan will both be delighted to draw each other and then you have Monaghan down which will be you know both teams probably glad of drawing each other as well yeah it's a really interesting draw right from the well I was going to say right from the start maybe not the preliminary round um, for Mana I'm sure it would, would have preferred any other team but Tyrone but uh, I've seen Fergal Logan talk, coming out and sort of talking about how it's an extra hurdle and a, an a, the extra game is, is something of a disadvantage but like Tyrone teams love that preliminary round that extra game that more momentum much like, you know, like Dramore this year in the club championship, they had the preliminary round and they really built on that and carried that through right to the final where they won. Um, in terms of, like, if you were to go on paper, odds on favourites and you had to pick it, it, it sort of shaped itself nicely that it could be a Tyrone and Donegal final. But, like, you know, Donegal, they're so touch and go. Uh, are they going to perform this year? They always sort of falter at the last uh, second. And then I wouldn't even be super confident and I know it sounds a bit ridiculous given that Toronto just won an All-Ireland but coming up against Derry provided yeah. that they, they get through is that, in I mean, Der- a, is that in Derry? Is that Derry I or think Toronto? so yeah. yeah so that, that, that yeah. Derry could win that yeah they could that's it you know and, that, and that's why it's so interesting that's why this championship is the one that everyone should be watching and all the TV channels should be fighting for their rights for it because each one of them games could throw up any form of a curveball from the very beginning yeah no it definitely would end of McGinley apparently they're drawn first against Cavan. Um, and he said there's already a plan for a protest because it has to be in Corrigan Park. I'd imagine the Ulster Council might try to shift it. We'll see how that develops. But would it be amazing to get uh, playing against Cavan at Corrigan Park? They obviously want their home their home advantage um, there in that one. Like, I mean, that's the Ulster Championship. Mo- the Connacht Championship, the only news there is that Mayo play Galway in the quarterfinal. Um so that's good news for everybody else that one of the two of them will be out. Obviously, Keane O'Neill is in with um, Porrick Joyce to try and improve Galway. Mayo still very, very strong favourites to win that whole Connacht, ty- Connacht Championship. At least we have a good game early. You know what I mean? And we'll have some good games early in the, in the, in the Ulster Championship um, as well. Great news for everybody in Munster is Cork play Kerry in the semi-final. So we have Tipperary Water for Clare Limerick who are going to be in the Munster final. And that is great news for them because the Talton Cup is in, a, is in play next year and that is all Division 3 and 4 teams are going to be in the Talton Cup. Whoever finishes in 3 and 4 at the end of next year's league will be in the Talton Cup unless you make your provincial, um, your provincial final. So one of Tipperary, Waterford, Clare, Limerick, you know what I mean, will be, will be well, Clare in Division 2 anyway, they're not too bad, but uh, that'll be good news for them. Leinster didn't, uh, Leinster didn't draw any any semi-finals they did this last year as well and it's just kind of a reflection on how let's call a spade a spade shite the Leicester Championship has become that if you do the draw the whole way through everyone will see at what point they meet Dublin <laughs> it'll be demoralising well that's it so they actually don't do they don't do any draws uh, for the semi-final until after the quarter-finals now so like I mean there's no doubt that's the reason yeah like it's kind of the Leinster Championship sure it's, it's been <laughs> said so many times the last the last few years, like how kind of how much of a dead duck it is, and like I think it was wasn't it West Mead that got Dublin last year, and it was just the, the season was nearly over. It, it literally was over before it, was it started, over, yeah. like in the uh, knockout, yeah, yeah, like ju- just like looking back and the monster draw, like as a Tipperary fan, you're you're delighted to see that because the exact same draw as 2020 when they got to the when they beat Cork in the monster final, like so Cork and Kerry in the semi final, it opens the gate for for those other counties, so. It, it can be hard enough to even think about the inter-county season at this stage when the club is yeah. going on and you're kind of just enjoying ev- the club every weekend. Like, But I suppose it does whet the appetite a small bit when you, sit, when you think of little plots like that. A, a little bit, but like, I mean, it's very, like, it's very underwhelming. Like, I mean, this used to be on television. and Like, I mean, I'm not blaming RT for putting it onto the radio because, like, I mean, they're, they're not a big draw anymore. The only Ulster Championship, really, the hurling's not a draw anymore because they're leagues. So you're only seeing when teams play each other in what round. Mm. So there's no draw in hurling. The only one that's worth um, while is the Ulster uh, football, isn't it? it? Isn't it a sad day really that the big, you know, we're back to we're back to no super eights. We're back to 2017 qualifiers, All Ireland uh, quarter final, semi finals. We're back to pre season competitions. Nobody has any really interest. There was no real interest Saturday in these draws. Like I mean it. It, you know, it, 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 for me, it, 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 can, can, compared to what we could have had, you know, it's a little bit sad that there's very, real, very little interest in a draw for our flagship, 
you know, competitions. And that's kind of that's kind of it. The hur- like I said, the hurling, all we know in the Munster Hurling Championship is that Limerick play Cork in the first round, which is fantastic. It's a repeat of last year's final. And to play Waterford in the second round, which is a repeat of last year's all semi semi-final. So, like, I mean, that's it. Kilkenny play Galway in round three in Leinster. That's all we have to discuss here. Like, it, really. it just doesn't, it doesn't really register with you now because it's just, like, it's just a date. A lot more Castellani is more interesting, yeah, really, isn't like it? like, it's just p- kind of... Up in the air at this stage, and you don't like you're not thinking about oh, can you playing Galway on July 31st? Like oh, I need to I need to get ready for that. Like it's just uh, it's kind of underwhelming, in fairness, like because it's it's so far away and. Uh, as you said, there's there's more important club stuff going on now. Like. Yeah, exactly. Here's another one I wanted to talk to you about because I was obviously talking about uh, to Conor McManus about this last Thursday and it's the under-17 competition. And you two lads are obviously an awful lot younger than me so you might have a better take. Like I said, I don't have a huge, um, strong opinions on it um, either way other than I don't see what was wrong with under-18 and the obvious thing is to go under-17 so that anyone under 17 can't play senior and there isn't a crossover and it doesn't mex- mess with fixtures and Conor McManus is able to tell me very quickly well sure why don't you just say if you're playing under 18 you can't play senior until the under 18 is over and maybe you know maybe play it off earlier there's a f- there's a solution there because uh, Joe Brawley was writing about this as well and he was getting a lot of reaction to it people feel very strongly about this um, Lee and I'm trying to understand it and what I'm understanding is that you play up until under 17 and then your next competition is under 20. And we all know the under 20 isn't as serious as the, mi- as the minor because people go to college, um, it's the best under 20s play senior and that's what they're more you know, focused on. And often I remember when I was under 20, you'd train on a Friday night when everyone would be home from college, you know, and it's kind of run off. Like I've, I think I've played an under 21 county final on St. Steve, you know, after Christmas or around Christmas time, it's not given the same prestige. And what people are, are a little bit annoyed about is that you finish at 17 playing minor instead of 18. That year from 17 to 18, you're in secondary school, you're still around at home, you're not in college. Why, why is that year of your life been wasted when you could be playing minor? And I suppose I do understand that argument. Yeah, and that, that's completely it. I mean, because you, like we talk about the... the the benefits of retaining players and how hard it is to retain players from minor level alone and that is with the under 18 so when you're making the cutoff point at 17 so that's a year less where you're less like physically developed you're still in school you're essentially still you know a child a teenager um you're you know living at home relying on your parents to cook your dinner and stuff like you're not a grown-up person but you're thrust in with all these uh beasts of men you know from like they're they're anything from 23 onwards up and you could even be a better footballer, but because physically they dominate you so much, uh, you can't you know express yourself in the way. And football just doesn't become enjoyable anymore. Uh, the under twenty thing is is exactly what you said. All the all the best players go straight into the senior team, and then that leaves a handful of players who aren't good enough, and there just isn't enough to fill uh, to fill uh, most teams. And the competition just try they try to run it off very quickly, and just whatever gap that they can find to run it off in. Joe Brawley in his article talks about how his own club he managed the minors the. Uh, St. Bridget's Miners, I think it was like for three years in a row, they reached a couple of county finals and things, you know, fairly successful. And the natural progression then this year was for him to take the under 20s. And he said like, it was just a disaster from the get go. The best players went straight to senior. He I didn't have enough players for a lot of the times and matches. They were meant to play Corrigan last week, and Corrigan being the, you know, the, the top dogs of Antrim football in recent years. And Corrigan couldn't be for the game last yeah. week, so it was just abandoned. But, that, but how like, come this that, is where how, you're at? How come that argument was never there for under twenty one level, which has all those same all those same issues? Well, I I would say the argument was there because um, when I, I worked with the BBC and Radio Ulster, I did a, a package way back in I think it was two thousand and sixteen about is there any sense in uh, the under twenty ones anymore because of the drop off levels and people not filling teams and the championship being ran off so quickly. At least then you're into uni before you've made that decision, you know, are you going to play football or not? And you had that last year at school. Uh, in ter- the, the argument back then, and I was actually talking to Andy McGinley about this, although he was in favour of keeping the under-21s, he said then that like maybe there could be more of an emphasis on reserve football, reforming it and making it a much more competitive and um, viable uh, tournament, you know, for players where they can develop in it. And then that would, in turn, would create more room for thirds football where 
the players who are, you know, semi retired or they just want people who just want to have a game and, you know, they don't want to take it very seriously. That's where they can all go instead of filling up the reserve leagues and reserve leagues can become more competitive and people, young players can get their games and develop and then take it on forward. Although I know in Kildare that they have now started an under 23 league and they're saying that it's very successful in terms of retaining numbers and stuff. But here's the thing. Like, you can't have the argument that you don't want the under-20 because it's impossible to run and have that same argument that you want an under-23, which seems to me what Joe Brawley is saying, um, Lee, am I right? Like, I mean, he's saying under-20 is a joke, but he's also promoting an under-23. Holy mother of God, if you're 22, 23, and you can't play senior, intermediate or junior at, at senior level, uh, for yeah. me, an under-23 competition would be the greatest nuisance of all times. Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying it's the answer. He's just as one of the yeah. examples that he used in terms of Kildare. Although, and said, and with that though, you would still have the under 18s. So at Kildare, they I don't know how they've done it, but they've just ignored the rules. They kept the under 18 um, model yeah. uh, and kept the minors as, as is. So I don't know. I guess the people who really play for the under 23 teams maybe are those who are off to college and stuff, and they're sort of there and not there. You know, they can be a bit flimsy with their time and schedule and their commitment and stuff and then the more serious players just play on for senior and because the age gap's just a little bit longer you know 22 to 20 or from 18 to 23 you'll just have a bigger pool to select from so you can actually field the teams yeah. but it's only an extra two years i'm not saying it's it's, it's definitely not the solution but uh, the under 17s is is a problem for sure and and they're gonna end up losing more and more players and even if the ga is they're so slow to fix things all the time that if it takes them another year then you're gonna have you know, two-year groups of players who've just missed out on their minors and maybe don't want to come back to football until the latter stages where they missed a uh, a brave chunk of their development. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with them with the under-18. I think that should be reinstored. The under-23, how can you... How can, how is that fixing anything? Anything is making it work. Like, surely, the guy I see it in Port Leash. Any of the young lads that finish under 21, if they're not good enough for senior, they're the lads that are making the, up the intermediate team. And the lads that are even not as good as that, they're the lads making up the, the junior team. And sure, you'll have no... If you have an under 23 competition to cater for those lads, like, I mean, what, what are your adult teams going to do? I actually couldn't believe it when I read that there was an under 23 competition in Kildare. Like, it's just... Like as you said, like who who's extra going fixtures, to play yeah. extra fixtures for lads? Like if you're not playing senior, if for when you're twenty two or twenty three, you're going to be playing junior, and like you're not going to be. I can't see like kind of traveling home for training for under twenty three, a competition yeah. that has kind of no tradition. But do you get my point that if you cannot make a case against under twenty or under twenty one, and then in the same kind of like only Joe Brawley could really do yeah. this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but like in fairness. I think the under-21, you were kind of saying that it's the under-20 and the under-21 are kind of similar and lads making the case for 21 against 21 that they should be against 20 then. But I just think it's the tradition kind of thing is a bit kind of adds to the thing. Like you'd like our our club, our clubs in Tipperary to be playing under-20 hurling and you'd still call them the under-21 teams, you know, yeah. and it's just kind of... The under twenty one was kind of taken seriously just because it's been there for so many years. Like, but right, and the under twenty is seen almost like a blitz. Let's a, just a do this bit, new yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, and the under seventeen is nearly the same. Like, and as as Lee was saying, like that final year in school, like, and you're you're eighteen years of age, you're still at home. Like the minor championship was like the that was the thing. Like, and that was what everyone would be talking about in school. Like when lads when it's under nineteen or under twenty, lads are up in college, and it's it's not the same kind of. There's not the same buzz about it. it nearly yeah. becomes a nuisance coming home for it and stuff like that. So, I think as Conor McManus said, it's it's kind of just mad that they changed it in the first place because there seemed to be no reason to change it. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's the that's probably the the, the best thing about it. Nobody nobody really asked for it. I do take your point with the under twenty one as well. When it's always been there, you might focus on it a bit more than this new thing. And what really annoyed me is the under twenty at inter county level now. Like that's I know Offaly got a lot of uh, you know coverage for winning it. But the reality is the best players play senior. The best players in the country are still are not even playing in that under-20 competition. Now, I think in Offaly, they retain them all at the expense of their senior team because they wanted to focus on it. But like David Clifford, Sean O'Shea never played under-20. They just went straight playing senior. And if you play senior, you can't play under-20. And that just makes a bit of a farce of it. And if it's a bit of a farce at the, under, at the inter-county level, you know, the under-20 at club level mightn't be taken as seriously at all. And maybe that's why clubs are not fielding teams. And it's just... It's gone a little bit messy. If you're if if the under twenty is turned into a bit of a joke and you're finished playing underage at seventeen, like that's not right. No, like it it does make a joke of it that kind of 
the the best under twenty players aren't playing for their counties, like and as you said as well, if if it's if it's not going right at at inter county level, how is it going to be going right at club level? Like when lads are kind of only they need to be coaxed, like some lads need to be coaxed along anyway, and they need to kind of have something, you know, something like like the under twenty one championship, maybe a bit of tradition that might bring them back or. The, the 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 teams did well in years previous. This time it's just a little bit haphazard, and it 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 is no wonder really that you're seeing these walkovers and teams not really clubs not really putting much into that under twenty championship. Yeah, exactly. Last one is Owen Cadigan retired over the weekend, and I thought he was worth mentioning considering we're talking about dual players so much on the show, and they are obviously extinct at inter county level. We know that there's none. He's the last one I think played. Two thousand fourteen was the last year he played both in the same year and then he focused on football for three or four years and then finished up two or three years um, you know with hurling so like I mean I think Podge Collins um, he's still playing but he's not playing dual and Seamus Kennedy don't think he ever played senior with the footballers did he Niall he's, he's more dual at, at club level yeah played I underage mean, with, he played underage football or he, play, he played one year I before he, he played, went I think hurler. he played a year with, uh, with tip football I'm yeah. not 100% sure now but, but these are just lads that have played both yeah it's a rare thing Cadigan's the last one. One. It, it's extinct <laughs> like 2014 Cadigan pr- pr- probably the last one that's ever done it I think so As Podge Collins I'd say was the same year 2014 wasn't it a year or two after they won the All-Ireland when he I think it was 2014 he gave the, both of them a go and it, it didn't really work out for him. Like he had too yeah. much going on, and he got. Well, he was on the slide on the hurling even before that. Anyways, I don't. I, I don't, Would you blame it I on? Th- the I think just yeah, maybe just the injury that he picked up. I think he did the cruciate ligament, and that kind of just, especially when he was doing so much, like it was hard to kind of get back from that. But yeah, like when not many lads, it is extinct, as you said, and it, it's sad enough, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, listen, we'll accept it being extinct at intercounty level, but we will not stand for the club level. We will not stand for it. It's just not going to happen. Paddy Cunningham, uh, Lee, as well, he retired over the weekend. Did what? Well, Paddy Cunningham. This is his second retirement, obviously. So, like, I mean, yeah. uh, we 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 won't we we'll give him a second tribute here. You can. Yeah, I mean, I bought a fantastic bear. He's been for Antrim, obviously. I mean. Uh, he's had to suffer with some illnesses and things. You know, manages whole playing career in and around that. But it's testament to him that I think, I think he's thirty five, thirty six or something. You know that he's still uh, able to play such an important role for for his county. Um, I don't know. I think he just didn't ever want to. Like Antrim's got a bit of a buzz about it. You know, at the minute under Enda McGinley, this new exciting manager. You know, he's promising. They got out of Division Four last year, and a lot of that was to do with him. He came off the bench on two occasions to hit two wonder scores right at the. Right at the death, uh, one in particular against Loud, Mickey Hart's Loud in the in the first game, where it just curled it uh, outside the boot and, and the last kick of the game to, to win it for them. So he's got them to Division Three. You know that a, a, a go at the championship. He knows he doesn't have much left in terms of his legs, what with his illness and stuff. So he can proudly retire today and say, you know, that he's left Antrim and his jersey in a better place than it was, you know, beforehand. And he, he can sit back and, and watch it as a fan. Yeah, exactly. A wand of a left foot. I think it was Ender McGinley did a lot of persuading to get him back last year. And probably the fact it was a knockout championship and it wasn't the longest season in the world probably, you know, fed into it. Um, and Paddy's like, don't come at me again this year. No way. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, you did, you, you talked me around last year, but you're not going to do the same again this year. Right. So congratulations to Owen Cadigan and Paddy Cunningham um, on two great careers. Owen Cadigan and Paul Galvin had some great battles. Uh, back in the day with, with the football. That was the fish hook e- incident, wasn't it? Where Cadigan or, or Paul Galvin had his fingers in Cat. Wasn't that Cadigan? Yeah, the, it was. The, yeah. the fish hook, yeah. So they had two right right uh, right battles back in the day. We missed Keith Higgins, wasn't he a jewel player for a few years there? Did he do the jewel? I'm nearly sure he did because he won, a, he won a Chris. Did he win a Christy ring with Mayo? Was it 2017 or 18? And he yeah. was playing football at the same time. He might have been, but in, with the Christy ring, it's played early early in the season so yeah. he would never have been crossing over during the championship yeah. with with uh with Mayo you I, know I think he w- he did it he might have played yeah. in the sa- he might have played it in the same season yeah. yeah yeah exactly right we'll leave it there before we start trying to find some more um we'll be back on Thursday and we'll preview the weekend's club action so we'll talk to you all then good luck